In November 2021, Bohemia Interactive and Rotators Collective released the Creator DLC Western Sahara for Arma 3. The DLC released for a discounted price of $6, with its regular price being $7. US dollars. With this price in mind, the DLC is a more limited release of content than previous Creator DLCs, which had larger terrains and more equipment and scenarios. Also departed from previous CDLCs, Western Sahara is set in 2036, a year after the vanilla Arma 3 campaign and follows established lore, while also reusing or reskinning many assets from previous Arma games. Because of this, the DLC fits well into the base game, giving fans of the vanilla Arma 3 setting, like me, a new setting to play around in. In this video, I'll be going over the lore and factions of the DLC. I will also give a brief overview of the extraction scenario. Although I couldn't find any information on whether Western Zahara is officially in the Armorverse canon or not, I think it can be safely considered canon light, at least until something else comes out that contradicts it. Keep in mind, there may be some misinformation and speculation included in this video, because there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge of the lore, but for the most part I will be going off of official sources and will at least attempt to verify information I get from the Armor Wiki. First off, let's go over the terrain, setting, and general tie-in to current lore. Safro Ramal is a fictional region in the northeast of the country of Argana, which is a nation in western North Africa. Not a whole lot is known about Argana, but we do know that it is a CSAT member state, or at least heavily affiliated with CSAT. It's possible that the Scimitar Regiment, which engaged NATO on Malden in 2035, was comprised of forces from Argana, but this is speculation. Regardless, we do know that Argana in 2035 is going through tough economic and political times. The Safro Ramal region is mineral rich with many mines and settlements dotting the otherwise barren landscape. The climate is extremely hot and arid and this has caused the people of Safro Ramal to be quite resilient throughout their long history. In the late 2020s, Safro Ramal was hit hard by climate change issues, causing widespread civil unrest and tribal warfare. Since then, the Argonian government has tried in vain to keep the region under their control, using the Safrawi Freedom and Independence Army. In 2036, the Tura, a tribe native to the area, wrested control of the region from the Argonian government. The central airbase was completely overrun, with Tura tribesmen obtaining a large amount of Safrawi military equipment. United Assistance, a peacekeeping organization attempting to distribute aid and limit the conflict's effects on non-combatants, was largely forced out of the region due to the widespread fighting. Amidst this, a foreign news correspondent, Michael Sully, has gone missing. Two ion security teams, Team Sword and Team Shield, were hired in the region to protect assets owned by the Dalt Green Mining and Exploration Company. However, the true objective of the ION team was to locate Michael Sully, hired by an unknown outside client. Team Shield would be in charge of the front operation, while Team Sword would embark on several missions to gather intel and eventually find Michael Sully, who is believed to be held against his will. Along the way, Team Sword will also assist the UNA peacekeepers by disarming minefields, transporting supplies, defending checkpoints, and eliminating snipers. Eventually, Team Sword manages to locate Michael Sully and raid the compound he is being held at. The leader of the Tura tribe, Arib Saeed, is likely killed when Ion moves in. Ion learns that Sully uncovered evidence of a conspiracy involving the Tura tribe. The project is known as Gold Seam, and reveals that Western nations have been backing the Tura tribe in order to destabilize the region and undermine CSAT and are gone in control over the area. Depending on how the players complete the mission, there are various endings, with Sully possibly dying or the conspiracy not being revealed. But even with the perfect ending, not much will change in Sephro Ramal due to the conflict being just another proxy war being fought in Africa. Next up, I'll do a complete overview of all the factions in Western Sahara. First off, we have the United Assistance, otherwise known as the UNA. Clearly an analog for UN peacekeepers, it is not known which country the UNA come from. However, based on their voice protocol, it can be guessed they are from a former French colony. The UNA operate with a limited mandate as part of the United Assistance mission in Argana, or UNMA. Their main objective is to safeguard civilians and non-combatants from the raging conflict. However, they have had limited success due to being a defensive organization. After the war started, most of the UNA presence in the region was recalled. However, a small contingent remains. It is not known if the UNA is a direct stand-in for the United Nations or a smaller regional peacekeeping force. The UNA generally wear desert tiger stripe camouflage uniforms with a mix of blue colored steel pot or ballistic Kevlar helmets. Blue berets are worn by officers. Soldiers wear blue armored plate carriers in a variety of configurations. Their primary firearm is the Velco R4 assault rifle chambered in 5.56x45mm, while their light machine gun is a Mark 200 chambered in 6.5x39 caseless. The Vermin 45 ACP SMG is used by helicopter crews. 
Optics are common, with most soldiers at least having red dot optics, and team leaders and others having MRCO 2 time sights. Their main sidearm is the ACP C2, a 1911 style pistol chambered in 45 ACP. UNA vehicle crewmen wear ballistic helmets with ear protection and comms built in, and helicopter pilots wear standard pilot's helmets. The UNA have no handheld light anti tape weapons to speak of. UNA light vehicles include Hemet multifunctional trucks, off roads, including up armored variants, and hunters, with all of these being unarmed variants to support the idea of the UNA being a defensive organization rather than an offensive one. The UNA also have access to AMV-7 Marshals that are equipped with a 50 caliber main machine gun and 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. The UNA also operate MBT-52 Kuma main battle tanks, although these are likely only used in a defensive capacity. The CH-49 Mohawk is operated as a logistical transport and heavy lift helicopter, once again being unarmed. All UNA vehicles are painted in a non-threatening flat white paint scheme with the UNA logo in bold lettering to let everyone know of their intention to avoid conflict, however this does not work on everyone, clearly. Next is the Safrawi Freedom and Independence Army, or SFIA. They act as the military force of the Argonian government in the region and are essentially paramilitary in nature. Although in 2036 they lost effective control of Safro Ramal, ceding much military equipment and personnel to the Tura rebels, they still remain an effective fighting force, attempting to regain control. The SFIA have been heavily affected by soldiers deserting their ranks, either to become bandits or to join the Tura tribesmen in their rebellion. SFI infantry wear fatigues in a semi-arid camouflage pattern and are generally equipped only with load-bearing vests, bandoliers, and sometimes light body armor for equipment carrying. For headgear, most forces are equipped with Soviet-era SSH-60 steel helmets for limited protection, although being paramilitaries, it is not unheard of for some soldiers to don turbans or other headgear. Vehicle crewmen wear brown sweaters. I suppose they must have air conditioning in their vehicles because that must get pretty hot in the Sahara Desert. Crewmen also wear Soviet-style soft crew helmets for bump protection, as well as built-in hearing protection. Pilots wear green fatigues in a standard helicopter pilot helmet. For firearms, SFIA troops are generally equipped with either an SLR, essentially a battle rifle chambered in 7.62x51mm, or a Galat arm chambered in 7.62x39mm. The SLR comes in a grenadier variant for launching rifle grenades. The Galat arm appears to be only capable of fully automatic fire, and when equipped with a drum mag effectively makes it a light machine gun, however the Galat is still utilized by non-auto riflemen as an automatic rifle. Optics are not unheard of, but generally are reserved for specialists while average soldiers use iron sights. PDW-2000 and Sting 9mm submachine guns are used by vehicle crewmen and pilots respectively. Night vision goggles are not common, however they are worn by vehicle crewmen at the least. The SFIA are equipped with green RPG-42 anti-tank rocket launchers and olive Titan MPRL AA launchers. For light vehicles, they use off-road and Zamok trucks in various configurations, including off-roads with improvised armor and Zamoks equipped with ZU-23 AA guns and MLRS systems. For armor, the SFIA mainly utilize BTRK APCs, although they are equipped with a limited number of T-100 Varsic main battle tanks, as well as ZSU-39 Tigris self-propelled AA guns. They also operate Mi-48 Kajman attack helicopters for close air support and air transportation. On top of all this, there are also static versions of the M250 Cal machine gun, Mark VI mortar, and ZU-23 AA gun. All SFIA vehicles are donned in a similar camo scheme to their uniforms. The Tura are a tribe living in the Safrawi Desert, who are historically nomads and caravan raiders. In recent years, due to record high temperatures, droughts, and other factors related to climate change, the Tura have been forced to modernize and begin to turn away from their traditional way of life. In 2036, the leader of the Tura tribe, Arib Said, led them in armed rebellion against the Argonian government and their SFIA stooges. In a surprising turn of events, they managed to wrest control of Safro Ramal from the SFIA. Under Arib Said's leadership, the Tura have become a major faction in the region, despite initially appearing to be only lightly equipped and funded. Their limited training and equipment necessitates asymmetric warfare, but they have been operating recently in large offensive actions. The Tura tribe are a tribal fighting force, essentially wearing a variety of tribal wear mixed with typical load-bearing vests and head wraps. 
By 2036, many former members of the SFIA deserted and went to fight for the Tura, bringing with them their experience and equipment. Because of this, and the looting of Safrawi weapon stores, the Tura are equipped largely with the same firearms as the SFIA, including Galat arms and SLRs. Optics are less common than they are in the SFIA, but specialists such as marksmen do have them. They also utilize RPG-42s for anti-tank use. The Tura mainly use light vehicles such as off-roads, including up-armored off-roads, for fire support and transport, but they have managed to obtain some BTRKs from the SFIA. Tura vehicles use a crude camo paint scheme. The Tura also use the usual static weapons such as 50 cal machine guns, Mark VI mortars, and ZU 23s. NATO has a limited mandate in the Sefrofermal region, having occupied the central airbase in 2035. However, they have largely pulled out of the area by 2036. They are US Army soldiers with largely the same equipment as the Mediterranean and Asian counterparts, with the exception of having desert multicam camouflage and ATGM and mortar variants of the AMV-7 Marshall. The final faction with a part to play in the Western Sahara is Ion Security Services. A distinguished US-based private military company, Ion sells its security services to whoever is willing to pay. They have a small contingent deployed in the region, officially tasked with defending mining interests of their clients. It is rumored they have ulterior motives. Ion contractors come from a variety of different backgrounds, and as such dress in a variety of different outfits and equipment. Mainly they are seen wearing light shirts and pants, and armored vests, as well as a wide variety of miscellaneous headgear such as bandanas and ball caps. Ion are equipped with the XMS Bullpup Assault Rifle, chambered in 556 by 45 mm as well as a variety of support weapons, including the Mark 18 762 by 51 mm Marksman Rifle, the ADR-97 5.7 by 28 mm submachine gun, the PDW-2000 9 mm submachine gun, the Vermin 45 ACP submachine gun, the Mark 200 6.5 by 39 mm light machine gun, and finally, they mainly utilize the PO-7 9 mm handgun for sidearms. Doing contract work pays, I guess, because Ion is equipped with top-of-the-line equipment such as thermal sights. For vehicles, ION uses AMV-7 Marshalls in a lighter CV variant, as well as off-roads, quad bikes, and Zamok trucks for light transportation and utility. All ION vehicles are painted in a black color scheme. ION also uses UAVs, including the AR-2 Darter for recon, and the AP-5 Buzzard anti-personnel drone, equipped with the 6.5mm machine gun. ION also has a small fleet of PO-30 Orca UP armored helicopters for general transportation around the desert, which come in both an unarmed and armed variant with missile pods. That's an effective overview of the Western Sahara DLC and its factions. By the time we leave Sefro Ramal, the region is in no better shape than it was when we arrived. The sands are still coated in blood, and the suffering of the region's people is sure to continue with no end in sight. Perhaps if CSAP proper came in to mop up the Tura instead of the ineffective SFIA, stability would be restored. Or maybe the UNA could deploy a greater force to ensure compliance with the laws of war and the safekeeping of civilians. Regardless, it seems the economic realities of the region are far from stable, and no matter what route the people of Sephora Ramal take, it won't be an easy one. This is 95% Rookie, thanks for watching, and have a good day.